Hello everybody and welcome back. So I'm just picking up right where we left off here. I just wanted to start another separate video for part F looking at developing an interval estimate for the unknown population standard deviation. We can, ex we can do one for the variance as well. In fact, it's basically all going to happen at the same time. Now, before we get into that calculation, I want to give just a very brief little review and discussion about confidence intervals because back in module 8 we talked about confidence intervals in some depth so we have some idea although it's been a while now maybe we've forgotten some of that material what I would like to do here is go through a bit of a, a, a derivation of the calculation for an interval estimate for a variance parallel to the derivation of the formulas, the calculations for an interval estimate on a mean. Because hopefully that's one that maybe we're familiar with or we remember from the previous um, module eight. So let me just scroll down here to where I've got a little bit of room to work with. So when we're dealing with an interval estimate for a mean, well, remember all of that is based on that normal distribution right or we can even start with that standard normal distribution that standard normal distribution had a mean of zero and it had a standard deviation of one now we've done lots of work with that standard normal distribution now we can define we know that we can define two values within that distribution that contain so much of the observations. I'm going to work here just for sake of simplicity. I'm going to work with a 95% interval. So I know that I can define two points. Call it here. This would be 1.96 and minus 1.96. Those are those two values from the Z distribution that correspond with 2.5% in the upper tail, 2.5% in the lower tail, and so 95% in between. Now, what does that mean? Well, of course, if I have a hat full of numbers, little pieces of paper with numbers written on them, and those numbers follow a standard normal distribution. Well, what it means is that if I just reach into that hat at random and I pull out a number, 95% of the time, that number will fall between negative 196 and positive 196. Once in a while, 2.5% of the time, I'll get one that's larger, and 2.5% of the time, I'll get one that's smaller. But 95% of the time, it will fall between those two numbers. Now, I can actually write this a slightly different way that makes no difference to the calculations, but just makes it a little bit easier to connect the Z distribution with our, our normally distributed population. Because here I can say, well, this is equal to, this upper limit is equal to zero, the mean, plus 1.96 times that standard, uh, standard error which we know here is one. That lower limit, well that's zero minus 1.96 times that standard error. Why don't I just write it in as a one? Maybe that's even easier. Now writing it like this, it doesn't change it. It's still minus 196 and positive 196, but now we can see the different components of those numbers. Because now, when I look at this and I say, well, you know, I'm not necessarily drawing from a hat that follows the standard normal distribution. When we're drawing our, our random values, we're drawing a sample mean. And those sample means are, of course, normally distributed. And those sample means, well, they come from a distribution that has a population mean mu, not zero, but mu. Well, because it's normally distributed, 
we can also define those two values within that normal distribution that contain 95% of those observations. That's going to be mu plus 1.96 times that standard error, and this is mu minus 1.96 times that standard error. So we can see the similarities here, yeah? Now, what this means, of course, is that when I draw samples from that normal distribution, 95% of the time, those samples will fall, or those sample means, will fall from between these two upper tail and lower tail values. 2.5% of the time will be too big, 2.5% of the time will be even smaller, but 95% of the time my sample means are going to come between those two numbers, whatever they are. Well, this is no different when we're working with a chi-squared distribution. When we're looking at a chi-squared distribution, it's the same idea. I can define two values within that chi-squared distribution that contain between them 95% of the observations. The notation that we use, this one is chi squared one minus alpha divided by two. This one is chi squared alpha divided by two. Both of those give me an area of alpha divided by two in the tail. So in fact, given that I'm working with 95%, I can rewrite this and this is 0.025 here, and this is 0.975 in that lower tail. So that gives me 2.5% above, 2.5% below. 95% of the time, if I have a hat full of little pieces of paper and they all have numbers on them, and those numbers follow a chi-squared distribution, 95% of the time when I reach into that hat and I pull out a number, that number will fall between those two values. Now, what does this look like arithmetically? So here I can say that z value that I'm drawing from that distribution, 95% of the time, it'll be less than or equal to that upper limit. It'll be greater than or equal to that lower value, right? That's just what I've drawn in this first diagram. Now, that z value that we're drawing from that distribution, as we know, it looks something like this. Now, I am intentionally not writing that little o, because that little o signifies a hypothesized value. In confidence intervals, there's no hypothesized value, right? There's just some unknown population mean. That's what we're trying to estimate. And so that value, that identity, exists between those two values 95% of the time. Well, you know, we can say the same about our chi-squared, right? Because I can draw a chi-squared variable from a distribution that follows a chi-squared distribution, and 95% of the time, that chi-squared value is going to fall between those two critical values, right? And that's the same as what I've just shown diagrammatically right here. Of course, that chi-squared value that we're drawing can be described like this, n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared. And again, I'm not putting that little o because that little o signifies a hypothesized value. No hypothesis here, just, just an unknown population parameter. And so that exists between these two chi-squared values. And as we carry on with this derivation, 
for this one, our unknown value, the one that we're trying to estimate, is mu. So if I just rearrange this and I solve for that mu, well then I'm gonna get something that may look a little bit familiar, that that mu is less than or equal to x bar plus z alpha by two times that standard error, and here x bar minus z alpha by two and that standard error. Now, because that distribution is symmetric, this z and that z are identical. They're equal in absolute value, which is why this is often written x bar plus or minus z alpha by two sigma root n. And that, of course, is the formula for a confidence interval for an unknown population mean because any time if I draw x1, if I happen to draw x1 from that distribution and I produce an interval around it, 95% of the time that sample mean comes from between those two values and when it does, if I produce an interval around that sample mean, well, it contains that population value. Same here for x bar two. I produce an interval around x bar two, and look at that, that one also contains that population mean. Once in a while, it won't. Right, if I produce an interval around x bar three, well, that one doesn't. But those only happen two and a half percent of the time on the upper side and two and a half percent on the lower side. So, all of this is the same for our chi-squared interval for a variance. I just need to here rearrange this. It looks like I lost one of my signs. Rearrange this for that unknown population parameter. So I'm gonna flip this over. Sigma squared, N1, S squared. I'm gonna keep the signs the same way so I need to switch those two critical values. This is gonna be chi squared alpha by two, and this is gonna be chi squared one minus alpha by two. And now I just multiply through by what I have in the denominator, and wouldn't you know it, I have my formula for an interval estimate for an unknown population variance. So hopefully doing this derivation side by side with a derivation for a, an interval estimate for a mean makes a little bit of sense because they're all, they're very, very similar. The only difference here is the distribution is different. One is symmetric, which makes things a little bit easier. I can condense that formula to something like this. This one's asymmetric all positive, I can't condense it down to anything more than what we see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do our problem. So we're doing a interval estimate for our standard deviation, which there we looked at an interval estimate for variance. Converting it to a standard deviation is exactly what you would think. I just square root everything. So. I have my sample size, this one was 45, so this is going to be 45 minus 1, and our sample variance was 13.6 squared, and here I'll have my inequalities, and this is 45 minus 1, 13.6 squared. And now we need those critical values. And this can be so easy to get these mixed up. Which critical value goes where? Make sure you pay close attention to that formula. This one is actually the larger one. That's the one that's gonna actually be in the upper tail of that distribution. 
this is the one that's actually in the lower tail of that distribution. So I want alpha divided by two, one minus alpha divided by two. Well, here we already have one of those. Oh, we already have both of those. Here's our alpha divided by two and our one minus alpha divided by two. So my alpha divided by two, if I follow this down, that was my 65.4. Sixty-five point four, and that upper one for one minus alpha by two. That's this one here, twenty-eight thirty-seven. Twenty-eight point three seven. So let's go ahead and calculate those. Get this out of the way. Sigma squared, so that upper limit, 44 times 13.6 squared, divided by 28.37. This gives me 286.86. And down here, times 13.6 squared, divided by 65.4. This gives me 124.44. There's my 95% confidence interval for the unknown population variance. The question was asking us for a population standard deviation. So what do you think we do? We just take the square root of everything. So the square root of that 286.86 is 16.94 and the square root of 124.44 is 11.16. So there is my final answer. We're 95% confident that the true population standard deviation for the grades of those students who have access to those workbooks and those accompanying video tutorials, 95% confident that the standard deviation is between 11.16 and 16.94. Okay, good. So that's it. That was kind of a long-winded way. Hopefully you just fast-forwarded anything that you didn't need to review. But there we have it, our final answer, either an interval estimate for the variance or the interval estimate for the standard deviation. Okay guys, thanks for watching. Bye bye.